17, please. Acts chapter number 17, we're going to pick back up, and we're going to look, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 18, I'm sorry, Acts 18, in verse number 24. We're going to look a little bit today at a guy by the name of Apollos. Uh, some of you are familiar with Apollos, some of you are not. Uh, Apollos is a guy who they, they, they jokingly said at the conference, that's Alex Kurz, you know, like, oh, he's, he's Alex, he's Alex, because Alex is a good speaker, you know, he's very pointed, uh, and, and, and what the term that the scripture uses is an eloquent man, right? So look at here at the Acts chapter number 24, and we're going to look at uh, uh, this, this Jew named Apollos. So 1824, Acts 1824. So just to give you an idea of where, where we're at, Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth here in the book of Acts chapter number 18. He spent a year and six months teaching them. It's a long time. And you'd think that after a year and six months, if the Apostle Paul sat in our pulpit, the congregation would all be in one accord. We would all speak the same thing. There'd be no divisions among you, but they'd be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. However, as we all know, the flesh is very powerful. And what does that flesh do? It just divides. Every time you start getting in that flesh, it breeds that carnality. It brings that division. And you have to get back into the word of God and, and understand it in, in the context that, of course, um, scripture indicates that we should read it and understand it. So with Paul being there for a year and a half, he then leaves, and every time he's leaving and, and going somewhere, he's being constantly followed by who? The Jews, right? The Jews are very anti him. They, they don't like him, even though really he came from them. He was one of them. And in Acts chapter 18, in verse number 13, it says, these guys, uh, these guys all came with an insurrection. They brought them to the local uh, judgment seat and tried to get the Apostle Paul in trouble, right? And they said, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law, right? So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going to lay a foundation here for Apollos because it's really important to see that, that the knowledge that Apollos has from his Jewish upbringing and the knowledge that he has from the prophecies of the scriptures can be built upon, right? Meaning what? Meaning you can get additional information. We're going to see that, that the Apollos was instructed, which means what? He, he was taught. So who was he instructed by? Probably in a very similar way to instruction of who? Of the Apostle Paul. You know, when you're a Jew, you go through. The, the, I don't know if you have a lot of uh, contact with Jews. Jews value education. Uh, if you, I don't. It's very rare to find a Jew. This is why you go and you see Jews that are dentists and doctors and orthodontists and, and, and physicians and all those other things. Because why? Because they they have a they have a they they're learned, right? They, they really spend a lot of time reading and, and understanding and trying to be educated. Now, with these Jews who are going to teach Apollos, it's going to be the same situation that you're going to have with the Apostle Paul. Now, of course, Apollos is going to learn from John the Baptist, which we'll see in just a little bit. But they're, they're constantly against not only Apollos, but really against Paul because he's persuading men to worship God contrary to law. What does that mean? Contrary to the law. Really, it's justification by faith. That's the biggest issue. That's the biggest dilemma that Jesus is the Christ, and that they need to place their faith in Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, as being the Redeemer. And so they don't like that. He's also teaching the Gentiles that are among the Jews that they should what? That they do not need to get circumcised. He's telling them that there's no need for them to keep the law, and that the only things they have to do are four things, which are what? Abstain from fornications, abstain from pollutions of idols, abstain from things uh, offered to idols, and then what's the last one? forget what it was, but it's one of those four. Uh, abstain from drinking blood. So those four things. And what, what, is that, what are those four things about? That's that keeping that unity because if you came in, it's kind of like you, you walk into a, uh, uh, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. You know, you walk in and all of a sudden you're drinking blood and the, gen, you know, the Jews are going, oh, oh my goodness. And the Gentiles are like, well, this is what we do. It's, it's, it's commonplace. And so again, to keep the peace, he said those are the only four things to do. And you think, well, what about murder? What, what, what about, you know, adultery? Well, we don't need to talk about that because you already know from your conscience, and, and he, you know, he's kind of explained that. So in, in relation to the law, of course, we can break it down and go for hours on, on the situation here, but they're really, you know, bringing him before uh, uh, Galeo here, and they're arguing that he is worshiping God. Con they're, they're persuading men to worship God contrary to the law, and Galeo's like, look, 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 if this is a matter of your issues and, like, your law, then, then you know, I'm not going to deal with it. You guys deal with it. And if you notice um, in here, then they, you know, they, they, they basically were pretty mad, and they, you know, you got, they got drove out of the judgment seat, and they continued to follow Paul, right? Now, as Paul goes through here, he is, he's been on a, a somewhat of a missionary journey, right? And what do we mean by missionary journey? Paul's only one guy, okay? 
And what we believe the scripture to teach is that the Apostle Paul got direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ on multiple occasions in which he would add and build upon, right? Because it is necessary to understand without that revelation. So as we look at the chart here, you know, many times we go, well, what, is, what is this chart all about? Well, again, th this revelation as we look at here is really important because it needs to be built upon. Because if you just look at this, the chart shut, it, it's, it's, it's not going to really make a lot of sense. Because you're going to try to do things today and you're going to go, that, that's not really, I don't know, I feel like just going through motions. There's really no, there's no power in that. And so what Paul does is he reveals to us today through his epistles today, obviously, but back then through his what? Through his word. So we're going to look in just a little bit that, the, that Apollos, a guy who was eloquent and also mighty in the scriptures, did not have what we have today as being the completed word of God and completed Bible. Very important point. So again, as, as, we're, as we're going through here, Paul you know, takes a Jewish vow. We've talked a little bit about that. We are going to get back into that in just a second, um, really when we get back into uh, chapter 19. But keep reading with me here. Uh, and, and as he goes through, he, in verse number uh, 22, he says, And when he had landed at Caesarea, he gone up and saluted the church. He went down to Antioch. So this guy's going from place to place to place. And what is his goal in going from place to place to place? Establishment and preaching. Establishing them in what? Sound doctrine. And, and doing what? Committing it to who? Other faithful men who can do what? Who can do the same thing. You know? Who can teach others also. Because he's only one guy, and he can only be at one place at one time. So he's going to need, as we're going to see, he's going to find guys like Apollos and go, I can use that guy. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he goes, I've transferred this to, to Apollos. And, and, you know, this is how it works. Now, what you're going to see, though, is there's, there's this, there's, there's the phenomenon that we see today with glorification of men, especially as it relates to preachers, happens back here, okay? Paul says, I want you not to think highly of us as if we're something that's, you know, now we have an authority because God has given us a position. We glorify that office, but you do not glorify and worship me, right? It's a big difference in that, in that viewpoint. So, so what you're going to see is the glorification of men that we see today like people like, I love, you know, whoever. I love D.L. Moody, you know. Okay, well, why? Why? You know, I like Chuck Swindoll. I don't know who. You ha people have these like, oh, they're just such great. Francis Chan, he's the best. I just, I just love him, you know. It, it's like the most recent one. Uh, I'm not going to remember his name now. Uh, I would try to remember it. Uh, Perry, Perry Noble. Another, another guy. Huge church, you know. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people. And people are flocking in, and God's doing this work and getting bigger and bigger. And what just happens? He has to step down. He had a huge alcohol problem and an issue with his wife. Massive. And what happens? See, when you build a church off of a guy, what happens? It just crumbles away. It, 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 it's just going through complete turmoil. And people have learned not to put their confidence in this guy, and unfortunately, they did not learn to put their confidence. They, they put their confidence in. They did not. They were not taught not to. And as a result, it, it really destroyed a lot of the faith of most of these individuals. So, getting in here in, in Acts chapter number eighteen, in verse number twenty-two, he's gone up to, to you know to, to Caesarea. He's going down to Antioch, and he spent some time there. And then he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order to what? Strengthen the disciples. Now, how does he do that? Is he doing CrossFit with them? Is he working them out? This is a great example of times in which you have to go, what? Uh, the Bible has to be read in context from a, from a spiritual perspective or a little perspective. What does it mean here to strengthen the disciples? Obviously, it means to strengthen them in the power of his might. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen them in the what? In the inner man. So he's going through and he's teaching them these things. But you have to remember, many of us have kids. And when you're growing up with kids and you're teaching them, I feel like I'm a constant broken record right constant constant I'm like don't do that i told you don't do that no 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 that's the way you, oh oh okay yeah and then sometimes i sit there and i just look at him and i go hold on let's break this down didn't i tell you not to do that yeah haven't i told you a hundred times before not to do that yeah but why did you do it and they just kind of oh i don't know <laughs> or my favorite is when he just does, doesn't look at me he just does this i'm like just look at me for a second because as soon as i look at him then i can get him to, to engage but you're, you're trying to constantly you know, strengthen him to do the things that are right. And this Paul is not just going in there and just telling him, okay, guys, be good. Stop doing this. This is about a total change of what? Of mind. That's really what his, he, he, his Paul strives for that in everything he does. He tries to get the people to understand. He's like, look, 
I, I want you to understand what God has for you. And that, and that everything that God has for you is so much better than all the things you guys are bickering and worrying about and arguing about, but I want you to, to understand it. And that, that difficulty in doing so is because he's only one guy. He could only go from place to place. But you notice when he comes there, people give heed, right? People listen when the Apostle Paul shows up. And when he writes those epistles, people, people go, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen I'm gonna listen to what he's got to say. So again, he, he strengthened these, these disciples by his doctrine. And then you get this guy named Apollos here in verse number 24. I find it fitting in this particular passage that, it, it, that, that we get introduced to Apollos because it's, it's, a really, it's, a, it's a good time for it to show up. Because you just had Paul in Acts chapter 18 and verse number 1 leaving Athens, coming into Corinth, and going, well... Got to make some money. Got to figure out where I'm going to stay. Because he doesn't have a house. Doesn't have, you know, it's not like he can just go on to, you know, what's the thing called? B&B, the, the little Airbnb. He can't go on Airbnb and go, where are we at today? And take an Uber and drive around. No, it doesn't work like that, you know. He's got to find something. So, of course, he's going to go, well, I know what I do. He's, he's got a craft. He works with his hands. He does the, the, the tent making. So he finds these individuals, Priscilla and Aquila, both as it says there, a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, and his wife, Priscilla, right? So, again, he wrought with them. And what did he do? He clearly didn't separate what? Work. And his spirituality and his understanding of being a quote-unquote Christian, okay? There was no compartmentalization there. He didn't go, okay, today is me, Paul, the tent maker, right? Obviously not. Why do we see that? Because over here, in just a second, when we read these verses, you're going to see that the Apostle Paul does what? He has such a, has such a, a rubbing off in, in, with the Priscilla and Aquila that they want to do the exact same thing that, that, that Paul did to them to Apollos, which is what? expound the way of God more perfectly. Bring them up to speed. And I would say that the majority of us today, when we start to understand and you know, we can talk about the, the concepts of right division, quote unquote, or we can discuss the concepts of dispensational thought or, or dispensational theology or whatever you want to say it. At the end of the day, you know, all those terms actually carry a lot of baggage, unfortunately. It's almost like those terms have become a denomination in themselves. So what I usually do is I say, yeah, we could talk about that. I, yes, I, yes, I believe in the concepts of right division. Yes, I believe that the Bible needs to be understood dispensational as taught. However, I think you just got to come back and just hit one thing really hard, and it's just that word context. You know, I mean, I feel like we, we, we drive that home constantly, 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 constantly. It's like context, right? And I give this analogy a lot, and I'll give it to some of you who have never heard it before. But the context is so important, Okay. When I, I, did a, I did a small stint at the state attorney's office. I did a uh, you know, fun little thing where I did prosecutorial work. I did you know, nothing really crazy, some criminal mischief, trespassing, DUIs, you know, simple battery, all that, all that fun stuff. Okay? Now imagine you know, something even more severe like a murder. Right? Let's say you're being charged with murder and you think it's self-defense and you go out and you do what? You're going to go hire the best attorney out there. Right? You're going to try to find the best of the best. You're going to call it Barry Cohen. You're going to call somebody to, to represent you. And you go and you try to find the best lawyer, and that lawyer goes, yeah, yeah, I got it, we're good. And the day, day of trial actually comes, and uh, you know, before trial, they do, they do these pretrial motions, right? Anybody have any additional pretrial motions? And you know, your lawyer is sitting there, and you're scared out of your mind, thinking you're going to you know, go to the electric chair, you know, and you're going, whoa, you know, and he goes, listen, I got this, I got this. So he walks up, and he says, yes, Judge, I got one here. And he opens up the law books, and he says, here's the statute. And he goes, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to move for a motion to dismiss based upon 762, subsection A, subsection B, C, D, 923, where it says the defendant shall be found not guilty. Quiet. Courtroom's quiet. Judge says, and then go on. And he goes, oh, I'll reiterate again, subsection, blah, blah, blah. the defendant shall be found not guilty. And he's gonna, you know what the judge is going to say? He's going to say, uh, counselor, approach the bench now. He's going to walk up, and the judge is going to go, what are you doing? And you go, what do you mean? He goes, what are you trying to do? He goes, I'm just telling you what the law says. The law says the defendant shall be found not guilty. He goes, yeah, yeah, it says that, yes, obviously. But did you read what comes before that? Did you read what comes after that? Did you take into any of the surrounding context? Right? No. And I would say that is what the majority of Christianity does. The majority of them live their life by Philippians 4.13. I can do all things in Christ. It's strengthened with me. You know? They put that on their little, you know, backpacks. They put it. It's, 
and, and, and hey, it's, 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 a good, it's a good philosophy, good understanding, but it's probably a, 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 a corrupt one, the way they think about it. Or the Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, right? Plans to prosper you. Prosper me. Yes, great. You know, and then you can go out and buy jets and do all. No. See, it's, it's really important that you handle the word of God in, in which way? Honestly. Not deceitfully. Okay? Now, what you're going to see is you're going to see a guy named Apollos who, unfortunately, is incomplete in his understanding of the scripture. It's not that he didn't have truth. That's really important to understand. It's not that he didn't have the word of God. He had the word of God. He was using the word of God, but it was incomplete. So here at Acts chapter 18 and verse number 24, you're going to see the rubbing off of Paul come through, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, because I'm sure that the guys, some of you here today, you get that fervent desire when you understand the truth. You, you want other people to see it the way that you've now been able to see it, right? You have like a, like a I, want, I want you to get this. I want you to see this. This is really important. And you spend that time and you desire the individual for what reason? For, to then profit off of them? No, simply so that you understand that they, if they are a member of the body of Christ, that, you're, that, that you are having the same care for them as if you would for yourself, right? It's, it's, that, it's that mutual issue of understanding that this is good for the body, because all it's going to do, if you don't understand this, is going to make my ministry ten times more difficult. So the more people that we can get to understand the word of God contextually, dispensationally, the way that God intends it to be understood, the more effective the body of Christ can be. The body of Christ becomes less and less effective the more it is divided from that denominational standpoint or from just the people, like I said, picking out one little verse and rolling with it, you know? I'll tell you, there's been so many times throughout this, I've lost friends because of the ministry. I've had people that don't even talk to me anymore because of the ministry. But I'll tell you that some of the ones who, who have, you know, written me off, as soon as something major happens, they give me a call. I had one not too long ago. A uh, guy calls me and he says, I need some verses on this. I need verses on that. I need verses on this. And I'm going, well, you got Google. <laughs> he goes, yeah, but you can't always trust that stuff. And I said, rightfully so, right? So there is a point, as Ephesians 4 discusses, that, that Paul wants, till we all come to the what? The unity. Till we all come to a what? The measure of the perfect man, the stature that is the fullness of Christ, that we actually get to that point. Not that we will one, you know, that, okay, maybe you can get there. No, till we all come. It was Paul's goal there in, in Acts chapter, you know, 17, 20, 18, 23, to strengthen the disciples. That's exactly what he did. And he says, and he had set apart those in the church, namely the apostles, the evangelists, the prophets, the teachers, to do what? To edify that body, right? So again, so look, that's in practice right here with Priscilla and Aquila. Read the verses. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. This sounds cool. Ooh, where are you from, Alexandria? Oh, okay. Sounds like the upside of town. He says, an eloquent man. And mighty in the scriptures, he came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Notice that word, instructed. That means that he was taught in the way of the Lord and being, notice this word, fervent in the spirit. That's good. Just because you have a lot of teaching doesn't mean that you're going to be fervent in the spirit. doesn't mean that you're going to go out and deliver the goods. He was fervent in it. He had a desire to see people come to an understanding that he had. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Perfect sounds good, except for the comma there, which says, knowing only the baptism of John. And I'm going to teach you and show you probably over the next two weeks that this issue of the baptism of John is not what you think it is. Most people just think, oh, the baptism of John, that just means that John was out in the wilderness crying and he was baptizing people. No, 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 no. No, it's, it's way more than that. And it's super important that you understand from a prophetical standpoint who John the Baptist was so then you can understand. So, so let me just explain this. The Bible here doesn't like tell you in great detail what he didn't know, right? He knew only the baptism of John. That's it. From there, you now have to do what? You have to go back and study out what the baptism of John is. You see how the scripture works? It, it takes an, I think the scripture is very similar. It, it does that because, I don't know if it's the complexity of God's mind, 
I, I don't know if it's his, just his desire for you to constantly get more and more in the word. But of course, I, we know that even if the Bible contained three pages with bullet points, you still wouldn't read it as much as you should, right? When I send emails out, I joke about this all the time, and I send out emails to our clients, or I send out emails regarding a training or an issue, and uh, I try to keep it really bullet pointed, because I work with a lot of lawyers, and lawyers won't read anything if it's a wall of text. They only read it if it's bullet pointed out. So I sit there and I'm bullet pointed out, and I tell the guys, look, that thing cannot go two lines. It's got to be dot, one line, dot, one, if it goes two lines, I'm telling you, they don't read that line. And so, you know, I, I, I sent one out recently, and uh, the, the lawyer came up to me, and he goes, you know, I can't get this, and this is not working, and we need to figure this stuff out. And I go, did you read the email? You know what he said to me? I don't have time to read the emails. You know what I said to him? You don't have time to complain, you know? When it comes to the Word of God, I think so many people go, you know, well, it's just, it's just so, I just can't understand it. It's so big and, and convoluted. <laughs> How much time have you really spent reading it? I think that's a, that's a huge point that I make to people. They complain to me, I can't understand the Bible. Look, <laughs> when, you, when you first sat down in your chemistry class, you probably went, I have no idea what any of this is, right? But as time progressed, you did understand it. it and that's the same thing goes with the Word of God. And I can tell you, it, it does not take years and years and years and years to become established. It took me, I don't know, a couple months to get a pretty good understanding and grasp on it. And then, you know, I'm still not to a point where I've arrived, quote unquote, you know. It's a constant state of growing. So again, here in Acts chapter 18, I want to make sure that you know what the baptism of John is and what the baptism of John is not. So again, it says in verse number 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Hey, isn't that where Paul's been lately? So what's going to be the problem? What are you going to start seeing? Uh, there's going to be some disagreement between what Paul's saying and what Apollos is saying, okay? And that's going to create some problems. Does it? Absolutely. It comes down to the point where the Corinthians go, ooh, we like this guy, Apollos. We're going to say we're of Apollos now. Well, why? Right? Well, it's because he's an eloquent man. So he says, when they heard, so whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, <clears throat> they took unto, unto them, right, they brought him, and they, didn't, they didn't beat him over the head. What'd they do? They took him, took him unto them. They brought him in. They said, let me tell you. And they expounded unto him. The word expounded is a word you don't really use that much. What does the word expounded usually mean? You're taking what you already know, and you're building upon it. You're expounding. You're making your understanding about what you know even bigger. So he's saying, look, that stuff's all good, and it's all unnecessary, and we need you to understand that to build on that aspect of the prophets. And you need to understand who John the Baptist was, and you need to understand that being the forerunner of Jesus Christ and the prophecies surrounding it. However, you are not preaching that today. You are not preaching the baptism of John today. I will tell you that there's a lot of people who do preach the baptism of John today. And the baptism of John does not just mean the John baptizing people in the Jordan. Okay? Look with me at these verses here. It says, And expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through, what's the word there? Believed through grace. I can assure you that there is no grace in the message of John the Baptist. The message of John the Baptist is repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I want to make it very clear at the outset if you're at this, as we start to get into this. That John the Baptist does not preach that you need to do anything for eternal life. I want to make that very clear. That John the Baptist preaches that in order for one to have eternal life, he must simply believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Nothing more, nothing less. Throughout all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... That is the message. There is not a gospel in your scripture that contains any type of works before God for justification. I want to make sure you, you get that at the outset. You don't mistake something that I'm going to say. It doesn't happen. It cannot occur. God does not receive any man's flesh. He is not a respecter of persons, and therefore he cannot what? He cannot receive anything done in a man's body. All he will receive is what? His son. And so how do you get a son? Well, you have to be in him, and he, he in you. And how does that work? The operation of faith is what he says. 
the operation of God by faith. So when we're studying this out here, I want to make sure it's really clear that, that, that the issues of grace are going to start to slowly seep out, right? You're gonna, you, you've heard the verses, you know, we'll say, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that in just a second. I don't want to get too far into it. So anyways, verse 28, he says, for he mightily convinces, this is a good thing. You want people who can mightily convince. I would say today that the majority of people who, who complain about, you know, oh, I have a friend, you know, they, they just think the Bible is bunk and they don't believe in the gospel and they think it's garbage and they think it's, you know, fairy tales. Have you tried to mightily convince them? I mean, have you sat down? I mean, I can tell you that I've sat with some people and I've really gotten them to where they were dogmatic and, and agitated and antagonistic. And fine, we'll just, we'll just, we'll, I'll, I'll try to mightily convince you. I'll try to persuade you with the word of God. Okay. Now it's very clear that we're not trying to persuade men to, to philosophy, right? We're not trying to persuade men to logical reasoning, right? But the gospel is very logical, the whole concept of it is super logical. The whole concept that is laid out has if-then statements, then have conclusions. So with his ability to mightily convince, we also need to have that, that drive, that drive to mightily convince individuals. Sometimes when we study through the book of Acts, we're not really getting anything like, well, what do I do? My dad used to always say, okay, whenever you're preaching, so this is, this is the, the, uh, I love my dad, okay? So when I start doing these like, uh, you know, I'm acting like my dad, you know, kind of thing. He knows. He listens. He's, I'm not, it's not something he's going to, you know, yeah. I'm not making fun of him, okay? My dad used to always say, you can never have a sermon in which you don't tell the person about something that they need to do. And I'm like, I mean, I get you. I follow you. It's important. He says, you got to have it have an impact, something that's going to help them in their life. You know, you, you teach and teach and teach and teach. Okay, now what did that do for me, right? Because they need to come away with something that will, that will impact them to go out and, and be a fervent, you know, minister of the body of Christ. So, again, here, my, being mighty, being mightily to convince individuals. I, I, you know, people say, I have, I have a tough time. Look, don't think for a second. Obviously, God is the one who does all of the increase, right? God gives the increase. But with how can they hear, as it says, without a what? Without a preacher. And it doesn't say how can they hear without somebody telling them. It says how can they hear without a preacher? See, when we use the word preacher today, most of it's in a negative context. Don't preach at me, right? Okay, now you get it. That's what preaching is, okay? It is mightily convincing an individual. Preaching is teaching, is edifying, is communicating with some type of fervent vigor. As if you actually believe it, you're not doing it out of obligation, right? Not like, well, you know, why do the Jehovah's Witnesses go knock on doors? They do it out of obligation. They don't do it because they really believe it. I, mean, I sat there and I talked to Jehovah's Witnesses for, this guy's come back four times, by the way. <clears throat> oh, yeah, they have, he's like, oh, I'm just doing this because that's what they told me to do. You know, I got to do this, you know. It's a little different for us. So anyways, he says he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, I like this, and that publicly. So he didn't make it something like, you know, oh, I'm only going to do this secretly. No, this was publicly showing by the scriptures, this is really important, that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, now, what scriptures did he use? Did he bust out the book of Romans and go, hey, guys, here it is. Check it out, Romans. Didn't have the book of Romans. Did he say, well, hold on a second. Let me go ahead and get you the book of John because, you know, John's the book, right? I mean, that's what everybody said. No. I don't have John either. So what's he doing? He's going into the synagogue and using what they have in their own hands, and there's nothing better than that. I've said this a million times. You know, it, I, I, I've learned, I learned this from a really smart lawyer, and he said, I'm going to tell you something. The best litigators are the litigators who know everything that their opponents are going to say. They know everything. And that what the best litigators do is they take that information that the other opponent's going to say, and they use it. They take every case, they take every opinion, and they, they talk about it, especially in the motions or in front of a jury. And they take all of that and they put it out there because you know what? If you bring all that to light, the person's going to go, okay, well, my argument's not going to really be any stronger now. It's actually going to be much weaker because you've already gone over all of this. And, you know, and that proof that you have in what they already use. Go look. I've been going the last two weeks. I have no, one more week left. I've been going to a, a shared scriptural differences course over in 
Zedek something synagogue over in, in Tampa uh, on every Tuesday night. I've been going there. It's, it's very interesting. Um, there's a Presbyterian minister, and there's the, one of the Bible teachers, quote-unquote Bible teachers, uh, that is there teaching you know, this two-hour course on, on shared scriptural differences. And you know, people are raising their hands and talking about stuff. And what I realize so much is that these people are looking for answers, right? But they're so naive. I mean, they just, they just buy it. The rabbi got up there the other day, and he was just like, he got into this whole thing of using the word metaphysically. And, I was, and I'm looking at him like, okay, you can use real big words, you know? Uh, you know what do you mean by that? Uh, he, he, they just, the, the way that they come across in trying to convince these people that Jesus is not the Christ, one person asked him, one of the Christian girls that was there said, well, what do you believe the Christ to be? Because she was reading the verse that says, you know, he's... How do you say that he's, uh, you know, the son of David if David calls him Lord and all that kind of stuff? So who is he? This, this guy's response, which I lost a lot, he lost a lot of credibility with me in this response. He said, well, it's just Jesus or the Christ, you know, not Jesus, but the Christ, the Messiah, is just all the Jews. And I went, what? I'm like, where did you get that one from? And what I thought was really crazy about this whole thing is their removal from the removal of usage of the scriptures, okay? The girl raised her hand and says, uh, is this the one where we read on the outside? And I didn't know what she meant by that. I'm like, I think she means about the little commentaries. You know, like halal. And have you, have you ever looked at the, uh, the, the, the Talmud before and how it's laid out? So, like, you know, you have, you have the, the Talmud is like their, their oral tradition aspect things and their commentaries that are broken out of, of the quote-unquote scriptures that they use. And so as you go out and out, it becomes like more authoritative, right? It's like as generationally it goes, people are learning more and more about it. And it's like it's never ending. It's almost like they keep revising it, keep revising, just like the new Bibles. They keep making new ones and new ones and new ones. They're saying tons of different things. And I'm looking at this going, how can you even, you know, we have to get back to the, the scriptures as a whole. I mean, like that's what we're going to. You can read what Halal says and all these other guys, but what does the scripture actually state? And these guys are so out in left field. Uh, he said uh, in, in uh, the woman taking adultery in, in John chapter 8. He goes, well, how many people do you think were caught in, in, in adultery? I said, oh, in that verse, she was caught in the very act. That, they, they're just like skipping things. They use the scripture so deceitfully, and, and, and they said it's not literal. I could talk, we could just have a sermon about all the things that I've learned about the Jews. And look, I have synagogues that I support in our, in our, you know, in our IT world that I work in, the computer world. I, I work for the synagogues all the time. I sit down with the rabbis and talk to them, and they, they know where I come from in these perspectives. They don't care, you know. To them, it really is, it's, it's 95% a social club. It's a social construct, right? It's not, yeah, they don't care about that. That's not really an importance. The real important for them is that you guys are part of the social club, and this is where we come and, and hang out and, and do the things that we do. So not to digress for an incredibly long time, but there, showing by the scriptures is an important thing to do. Let the scriptures work. I was sitting one time in, a, in an office, three lawyers. One of them has his doctorate of divinity from some, you know, like Harvard or some craziness, right? And so he's arguing with me. And I didn't really give him any argument. I just kept giving him verses. And the other guy goes, stop giving Bible verses and start telling me what you think. And I go, it doesn't work like that. I said, I, I, don't, I don't care what I think. That's the verse. I'm just giving you the verse. I'm giving you the verse. I'm giving you the verse. And I said, the reason why you don't like the verses is because they, they agitate you. Because they're, they're truth, and, and they, they get to your core, and they, they undermine the argument that you have. So again, I'm trying to tell you, you should mightily convince individuals. You should strive to mightily convince people about the word of God and about the gospel. If you show some passion about it, I mean, the little, little girl walked down the street the other day, and she walks up to me, and she goes, Would you like to buy some cookies? And I go, sure, I'll buy ten boxes. And she looks at me, and she's like, okay. And that's probably the easiest sell she had all day, you know, like... It, she didn't have to mightily convince me. That's how I think most people come up with sharing the gospel. Most people chicken out, I call it, and they just hand out tracts. Tracts are good, but I tell you, it's far more beneficial to, to, to talk to people who you have relationships with and not just the cashier at Publix. Make you feel good. Well, I passed out like 20 tracts this week, you know? Great. You know? Did you follow up with any of those people? You know? It is important, and you should have a part of that in your ministry. Start small. You know, don't think you have to talk to everybody in one week. Just pick, pick somebody that you have, you know, that, that's on your heart and talk to that person. Just go talk to them. Have a conversation. 
ask a lot of questions. Don't go out there with a bunch of declarative statements. Walk in there and ask a lot of questions and see where they come from. See what they believe. See what their thoughts are about the situation. But you need to be mighty in the scriptures because you might have, you know, it's a good way to get you back in the word of God. Go get it handed to you once or twice. All right, so let's break some of this down here. Certain Jew named Apollos, he's eloquent in the scriptures. What does that mean to be eloquent? Well, turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter number 4, and verse number 10. And we have a guy named Moses, right? And Moses, when God tells him to do something, does what? Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> well, well, why? Uh, because, you know, I just... This is, this is, a, this is a, you know, I, I'm preaching from the heart a lot today, but... <clears throat> When I look at this with Moses, and I think, hold on, hold on. God's talking to you. <laughs> right? You get that? God is talking to you, and you're going, eh, eh. So when somebody says, oh, God just came down and talked to me, I go, no, nah, probably not. You know? I mean, look what happened right after the Exodus in the wilderness, after the nation of Israel saw everything that God did. And yet they still were out like, oh, he's just left us to die. We don't know what happened to Moses. We're just going to go out and worship these idols. And you see how perverted that flesh was and how corrupt the Egyptians had gotten into them. And so you see here in, in uh, Exodus chapter 4, in uh, verse number 1, And Moses answered and said, uh, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto him, What is that in thy hand? He said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. See, what you're going to see here is, you know what it says, the Jews seek after a sign? That's not just something that, that, you know, is stated by the Apostle Paul. That's throughout the entire scripture. The Jews constantly seek after a sign because what? They walk by sight, not by faith. So every time that, you know, like Moses is sitting there trying to do stuff, what is he doing? He's bringing works with him, right? He's got to bring them something to show them so that they'll believe it. And God doesn't like that. It's like Gideon and the fleece. Same situation, right? God's like, what do you mean? Well, Gideon's like, I'm just not sure if you're serious about this. Can you just go ahead and make the fleece? I mean, you can't just imagine tempting God in that way. And, you know, growing up, I thought that's what something you should do. I remember as a little kid putting something outside of my house and saying, okay, God, Make the do not be on it in the morning, and then I'll know. I'm like, but, but should I make the do on it? Because then I really want to do the thing that I want to do, and then definitely will probably have do. It's more likely that it does. And I went through the whole breakdown in my little head. But anyways, it says here, and he said, and the Lord said to Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and he caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of the, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into thy bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous to snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Now you think by that, you'd be, Okay, 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 I get the point. Right? I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. I, you're, you're God. You can do all kinds of stuff. I, I understand, I believe. No, it keeps going. And he said, and, he, and it came to pass that they will not believe thee, and neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And if it shall not come to pass that they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken to my voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it on the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And he's like, oh, okay. And now notice this next phrase that Moses uses here. And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. See, this is what people re forget to realize a lot of times is God's not looking for you to be eloquent. You got a mouth? Can you talk? Yep. Good. You're hired, right? That's how it works. So here, Moses' objection is that he is not eloquent. In other words, neither hereto nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But look at this. This is the definition that we're going to be using. So I like to use a scripture, divine eloquent. Sure, I can go to M-W and, and type in eloquent and read a definition for you. Or I can do what? You can use a scripture to define it. I love doing that. It's more, more exciting. You get to open up the word of God. How, when was the last time you looked at the book of Exodus? It's probably been a while, right? So again, it reads and it says, But I am, uh, uh, I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. 
right? So that's what it means. So go back with me to the book of Acts. In chapter number 18. <clears throat> so this, this man, Apollos, he is the opposite of what it says in Exodus, right? Meaning, if we take the opposite of that, that passage, he's a past talker. You know, he, he, knows, he knows what to say. He knows what's on his mind. He quickly can articulate that which he's thinking. And so here, this guy being an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, in other words, he's good with words. Look at the book of Isaiah. Uh, three, chapter three, and verse number three. <clears throat> Wrap this up in a few minutes here for next week. Isaiah three, three, and it says, the captain of 50 and the, and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the, notice this word, eloquent, what's the th word there? Orator. I love that. The eloquent Orator. You know who usually are the eloquent orators? Salesmen, right? They have to be so cunning and, and eloquent how they how they sell. It depends upon what they sell, right? I was just talking to my friend who's uh, who's now a finance manager in uh, in the in, you, in the car business. She works for a Honda dealership. We we're talking. She's like, I'm gonna make some great money, and I'm like, okay. You know, she's telling me how excited she is to work in this this new this new career field, and and I said I said you know the thing is. You got to just sell people a bunch of stuff they really don't need, you know? And she's like, oh, no, man, it's, it, they need it. And I said, look, somebody's already sold you about this job, you know? I said, can't you see how this works? I said, somebody that was better than you, the previous finance manager, trained you, and now they're training you to be this, this eloquent seller of these warranties. And one of the things she was telling me, like, yeah, so they break it down, and we have four things, right? So it's all these four warranty packages. It starts, like, you know, $1,000 to, to, to $4,000 or whatever, and and the crazy thing about it is they can say no, that they don't want any of them. But what we say is, which one do you want to choose? And I'm like, that's so deceitful, you know? I mean, that's such a, that's such a scam. But it's not. I mean, it's, it, they're, they're, it's the tactics of how they do it. So anyways, being an eloquent or, 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 or a cunning orator is somebody who is good with their words, somebody who can speak very well. So obviously this guy, Apollos, He's eloquent, and then he's not just eloquent, he's also mighty, as it says, in the scriptures. So to be mighty in the scriptures, we have to define what those scriptures are. And uh, let's just look at that briefly, and then we'll pick up next week, okay? So to define what the scriptures are, this is super important. I think people don't understand this, and I talk to people about it all the time, and they, they literally look at me like, never thought about that before. Do you realize that the church at Corinth did not have a completed Bible? Right? I mean, do you, do you understand that? Do you get that? All the more why it's super important that they find faithful men. You see? It's all the more important why they have good individuals who are sound doctrine, who will do and, and, and follow the Apostle Paul as he follows Christ, right? All the more important. But then also you can see how quickly and easily they can start to diverge. And then what happens is you get this authority that comes back through Paul, through his word, through his letters, which then becomes authoritative as scripture. It's pretty cool. Like that's the building of how it becomes. You know, like you think that the, the, the Corinthians, when they read the, 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 the first letter, the first epistle, they were like, oh, this is the new scripture. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, it didn't really cross their mind. They just knew this came from the apostle Paul. And they recognized his office, and they, they respected that, and they took it. As it was in truth, the word of God, and those that effectually believe, right? So we're going to talk, we're just going to look at this one verse here and define it, and then I'm going to give you the summation of where we're going to go next week. Okay, look at me in the book of Luke, chapter 24. Two minutes, and we're done here. Luke 24, 44, and it says this. So this is after Jesus Christ has been resurrected. In verse number 44, it states the following. And he said unto them, These are the words I, which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the what? In the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning who? Concerning me. So therefore, it's a good idea to, to look here as a definition of, of what is scripture? 
So when we see that Apollos is eloquent and mighty in the scriptures, you have to define that. And here you see in verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand what? The scriptures. So now we're going to have to break down and look at the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And then we'll see how he understands what John the Baptist is to do, okay, from a, from a perspective of prophecy, right? Obviously, John the Baptist is prophesied as coming. And then what his message does contain and what it doesn't contain. Because it's really important to see that because, look, what you're going to see is he doesn't have a saving message. The Apostle, the Apostle Paul taught Priscilla and Aquila the saving message of grace, which then gets rubbed off and translated onto Apollos, and then you see how he becomes a faithful minister and he's part of the brethren. So we'll pick up next week with that, and we'll, you know, and, and we'll look at the importance to know the content of his message from the study of scriptures. And there's some weird issues we're going to talk about, of course. I'm going to try to get into some of these things with, with, uh, because we're talking about John the Baptist. There's some, there's some future belief that there's going to be another John the Baptist, that there's going to be another Elijah. So we'll get into all that. This, I think it's interesting to talk about because it will help understand the baptism of John a little bit more in detail. All right, I appreciate your patience. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Father.